Well, it's so good to be here. Like uh, several people, I have not done a lot of traveling or a lot of speaking in the last couple of years. So it's really thrilling to actually see human beings in the flesh again. And uh, it's uh, like for me visiting um, an old part of my life because in the 1980s, I'm sure I came to one of these conferences. I can't tell you when it was, but I was very heavily involved in all things energy efficiency and was part of a, an energy efficiency group within an architectural firm very early on in my career. And uh, I can see a lot of the passion that uh, I had then and still have now. It's taking different forms these days, but I'm thrilled to be given the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, before I start, I want to let you know that I have something called essential tremor. So if you see me shaking, I'm not nervous. It's just what I do. My husband calls me the shaker. <laughs> um, so anyway, I want to give you a little bit of background. Before I start, how many people are familiar with any of the Not So Big House or Life books? Maybe, maybe a, a sixth of the audience. So those of you that have never heard of this stuff before, I'm going to give you a very limited crash course in what Not So Big is about. But primarily, I want to tie this together with what you're doing in the world right now, because it's incredibly important. And as my remarks will bring back home, each of us has a role to play that we don't often see in the middle of our lives. And so I'll weave that story through uh, what I'm describing in terms of my own career so that it may inspire you to think a little differently about your own uh, steps in the world. So in each of the books that I've written, I've referred to this quote from Gandhi, which we've all heard, we must be the change we wish to see in the world. But I believe we don't completely understand what he means. And so I'm going to come back to this quote again at the end of this talk and pose a different way of thinking about what Gandhi was saying, because it's incredibly important and it has the capacity to change every single life in this room. So pay attention and uh, follow, follow along with me and I'll illustrate what it is that it means, I believe anyway. So I grew up in England. Um, I moved at the age of 14 to California, but this is the village that I grew up in with footpaths everywhere. And uh, we went to the store every day to buy our groceries. It was very not so big life. It was a very small scale world and everything was the way it was. And any of you who either live in Europe or other countries right now, or have uh, lived in that kind of environment, you know what a shock it is when you suddenly move to some place like Los Angeles, which is where I moved uh, to a suburb where as far as I could tell, there were only cars and no people. It was quite a shock because, you know, in England, everybody walked everywhere. And suddenly I didn't see someone for two hours of walking. I didn't know what happened. We walked to the grocery store for a couple of days and it was an hour and a half excursion. It used to be a three minute trip to the store and everybody knew each other. So right from the get go, when I moved to Los Angeles, I was wondering what happened to the place that people call home? Why don't we know each other here? And then when I did get to know people in my school, I realized that the living room and dining room, which seemed to take up most of the space in the, in the main level of the house, were, as far as I could tell, almost never used. So, I mean, in our my English house, we used those formal rooms. We lived more formally. But here, it was seemed like they were some vestige of a bygone era, but nobody had bothered to stop building them. <laughs> so anyway, I got interested in architecture and I began to think about house design. I actually went to uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, so I know this part of the world pretty well, and uh, then finished off my uh, degree at the University of Oregon. Um, but I was fascinated by this issue about house design, because although 
I was trained and for my early career it was actually in, in a, a firm that did energy efficient larger scale buildings. I was fascinated by how is it that we have this huge number of homes being built that really have nothing to do with what people really want. And actually, as I started my career, um, I watched what people came into my office asking for, they, not this big, I will say, but uh, they always were looking for more square footage than they could afford. And they thought they had to build a good half of it for resale, but they themselves weren't planning to use this. So I thought, this is crazy. What are we doing? And so I, I actually um, used to do talks for DOE around the Midwest on multifamily energy efficient design and construction. And so after every talk, somebody would come up and say, does your firm do houses? And I would say, well, actually, no. Um, and so I'd send them off to some friend of mine that would moonlight it at night. And then I suddenly realized I could start a firm. So that's what I did. And I, I started a company in uh, 1983 with my partner, then Dale Mulfinger. And uh, we started a very small firm. By the time I wrote my first book, The Not So Big House in 1998, we had 45 people doing all single family individual projects. And it was unheard of. There was one audience, probably a similar size to this, I was speaking uh, at an AIA convention and we had really changed the, the world of Minneapolis um, by making house design available, architecturally designed house design available to the general public. And I was at an AIA conference and I said, well, now that we're getting so many more clients and people asking for architecturally designed houses, and before I got to the end of my sentence, a guy stood up in the audience and said, lady, what planet are you living on? We don't see that. What I realized was we had by individually working with the people who wanted a better house, we had changed the whole city and we had lots and lots of colleagues start to do the same. So one of the first steps to thinking about how to make a difference is to do what you see as needed. We, you know, it wasn't the normal way that architectural firms were run, but we figured out how to serve an underserved population. But the thing that was missing was that everybody wanted bigger and bigger and bigger. People would always be asking for more than they could afford. And so every new client, we had to train them into a, a way of thinking about what they actually needed, which we came to talk about being about a third smaller than you thought you needed, but with the same amount of money spent so that you had a quality house that was going to last for the long haul. But everybody's looking for that feeling and they think it's going to come from more. And the whole point behind not so big is that it's not about the more quantity, it's about higher quality that really reflects who you are. So I ended up, this is me a very long time ago, and I, I was doing public speaking at home and garden shows, at builder shows, at any place that would listen about this issue of what are we doing and how do we solve this problem? And I tried to teach people by using language that I realized they didn't know because architects had all these principles and ideas that we would regularly use. But oftentimes we weren't very good at explaining what we were doing. And so people would not be hiring an architect. They'd be going to the builder because it seemed like, well, the architect is a lot more expensive. So we had to make a connection to the people that wanted what we do, but the people that wanted what we do didn't know who we were or what we did. And again, there's a parallel with some of the, the worlds that you guys revolve in, in that you've got something that this world needs desperately right now, but a lot of people don't understand how or why it fits. And so although I don't have the answers for you, what I want you to do is see the, the things that happened for me as I went through my own career and look at your own life and say, what do I know that really needs to be articulate or ver articulated or verbalized? And how can I do that within my community or my uh, group of, of uh, people that I know around the world so that we can start to change right where the issue is? 
So the thing that I really recognized was that the people who wanted a nice house didn't know how to get it. And so the language that I developed and then wrote about in the Not So Big House and in all of the other books was really taking what I knew and translating it into very simple language that people who aren't trained in design could follow and then start to ask for. One of the things that frustrated me the most was that when I tried to talk to bankers or um, lenders or builders or developers, all of those people didn't really see the need for change because everybody was making money off of the process of building a bigger house. But the people that wanted a really nice house weren't wanting all of that stuff. And so I realized the only way to change this picture is to give that group of people the tools to say, hey, I don't need those rooms. I want to spend my money this way. Help me to do it. And that's really what the not so big house movement uh, was and how, how it has continued over what uh, that was 1998. So 24 years now, it's still going strong. But in the course of that, creating that firm, this is actually a picture from many years ago with a beautifully fuzzy lens. <laughs> um, there was something that was missing from that world. I was one of the partners in the firm. Uh, it was busy life and it was a lot of fun, but all my life, I had actually wanted to do one thing more than architecture and that was writing. I loved writing as an English school kid writing was what I was trained to do and I wanted to do more of it but my father when I was growing up had said look why don't you wait until you've got something to write about and although I wasn't particularly thrilled by that advice I took his uh, his suggestion and uh, so here now I was uh, ready to write but with absolutely zero time and so the, the world that I lived in, like I suspect many of you do, there was barely time to, you know, stand up and, and take a walk or anything like that. I just, I just did not have the time in my day. And that's when a really big realization came to mind. When I looked at how I described my life to my friends and to people that were asking me how I was, the very first thing I would say is, I'm too busy. Well, that's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. One of my phrases that I use these days and I use in the Not So Big Life is, our thoughts are the architects of our world. So if you keep self-defining on too busy, that's what's going to manifest. And it sure did in my life. And I realized at some moment, wow, is that what I really want to be? is too busy? No. So I, I realized I'm, I was in a cage of my own creation. This was the, a world that just didn't, didn't serve any purpose other than to keep me on this kind of tread wheel of, of misery, really. Although I was having fun, I had a lot of adrenaline in my life, I wasn't really living. And it was right around, um, I think it was the mid 90s, I went to an AIA convention and I heard Paul Hawkins speak. And it was one of the most powerful speeches I've ever heard in my life. There were, I think, 6,000 architects in the audience. And he stopped sort of in his normal process of his presentation. And he, he said, I want to talk to you guys because you have the capacity to change the world. And the people in this audience are needed but most people don't know they need you. And then he said these words, he said, follow your heart, speak what you know. And I felt as though he was speaking right to me in that moment, because I knew I wanted to write, I just didn't know how I was gonna find the time. And so that was a piece of a puzzle that really taught me to stop self-defining as too busy and to start looking at what is it that I really want to do and really want to say. And so it was really as a result of his speaking that, and then an epiphany that I talk about at the beginning of the Not So Big Life, where I realized I have got to make a change. I don't know how I'm going to do it, 
but I need time to write. So I'm going to make myself into my own new client. I'm going to pencil myself into my calendar. I'm going to give myself a project number and I'm going to start writing. That was the only way I could figure out how to make time. And although I thought that my clients and my partners and my colleagues were all going to fire me, they didn't. In fact, the universe supported me in ways I couldn't possibly have imagined. And in fact, Taunton Press called me because they had heard that I was interested in writing a book. They had a new publisher and the publisher said, we want you to write a book called The Small House Book. I thought, well, that's okay, but I want to get to the people building huge houses. How do I do that? They're not going to buy the small house book. And so oftentimes when I'm starting a new project, I'll write an introduction to myself. It's not the introduction for the book, but it's really, what am I writing here? And I wrote a few pages. And in the last lines I wrote, in fact, this shouldn't be called the small house book. It should be the not so big house. And I thought, that's it. It was divine intervention. <laughs> I, did, I didn't get known as the small house lady. I got known as the not so big house lady. <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing because it has really helped to bring not just a, a discussion about size, but about a sensibility, an attitude about house, community, and life that is absolutely where my heart is. And so this first book, which is the one that has really been the, the best seller of the whole group. It's very simply written. It's almost like a, a philosophical statement. You can read it in a night and people come in the next day it, it, into architect's offices and say, this is what I want. I've got literally thousands of the same emails saying, I read your book, this is what I want. Where do I find an architect who does this? So then I had to start a home professionals directory to help people find the architects that could do this kind of work and were interested in doing it. But that it all snowballed out of just the willingness to commit to this desire to write and having something, as my dad said, to say. <laughs> so just very briefly, what does not so big mean? It's really not about size, but it's about building better rather than bigger, building to last and to inspire and built for the way we really live. It's very simple. And it's, you know, people often ask me, so how big is not so big? It's all different sizes. I usually say, you know, if you're able to live in every square foot every day, that's a not so big house. So here are some examples of not so big houses. The bottom left one is actually the house that I built for myself in St. Paul, which paradoxically was at least twice as big as the house I left in order to build this house. But I needed to have an example of what I was talking about. And I wanted it to be relatable enough that everyone could see what I was talking about. So this was 2,400 square feet, including the lower level basement walkout, 973 square feet, I think on the main level. But it really exemplified what needed to be understood that you don't need a giant amount of space in order to have it live larger. And I'm not, you know, if you came to one of my regular talks, I would then be telling you how to do this and we would go through all the details of it. That's not what tonight's about. I'm mostly trying to give you a sense of the trajectory of how you take something that you see as needed and start living that truth and that meaning so that others can do likewise. It's also about livability and comfort. It's about being able to curl up with a good book in a corner rather than needing about 30 people there with you so that you don't feel like you're in some sort of cathedral. It's a totally different way of living. And a lot of people end up building or buying an existing home and remodeling rather than building new because that's what they want. And we at least know that that size is there in a smaller house, an older house. But at the core of what I'm describing has to do with something that we very rarely talk about. How many architects do I have in this audience? Yeah, so we all work and builders, architects, craftspeople, we all work with three dimensions. But when we're working with a, a client, oftentimes they've never really thought about the heights of things. 
And people look at floor plans and assume that the floor plan is going to tell them everything they need to know. And so I had over and over again, people came up to me and said, well, I built my dream home, but it turned out it wasn't, it wasn't the right house. And I started to realize you don't understand that the plan doesn't tell you what the house is going to feel like. So that became a big piece of what my books are really trying to help people understand. I talk about how children are naturally attuned to spatial experience. They gravitate to the most interesting spatial experience in a house. Leave a five-year-old alone for five minutes and they have found it. We adults forget this. We actually still have it, many of us, but we're not encouraged to explore it. So in the Not So Big House and the following books in that series, I make the following metaphor. And metaphors are very powerful to help people understand. So I ask my audiences, so what does a map of a city tell you? Well, we don't imagine from looking at a map of a city that we're going to know what it feels like. Obviously not. But that's what we're doing with a floor plan. A floor plan tells us whether our couch will fit and it tells us how to get from the garage to the kitchen, but it tells us absolutely zero about what that house feels like. For that, we need information about that third dimension. And so that little, I mean, it's like the punchline of all of this book series, but it's revelation to most people. And in fact, just to bring home the point, when I wrote my second book, Creating the Not So Big House, which is all about the third dimension, the first woman who interviewed me wrote an article after we had talked, and fortunately, she sent it to me, and she thought the third dimension was the same thing as ESP. I am not kidding you. So we had to start over, and I said, okay, <laughs> the third dimension means the heights of everything. We even changed the book a little bit so that we could make sure that people really got what this was about. That's how much there's these other dimensions are outside of our awareness. So I'm just going to show you three pictures that illustrate this very simply. There are two are the same, but here's a space. This was a remodeling where somebody had taken out a kitchen wall and put in a, a, an arched opening. And then here's what it looks like when it's just the floor plan without the arched opening. Now you may like it better this way, but the point of the picture is to say, when the arch comes, there's differentiation between spaces and that allows for less square footage to feel like more. Simple, but it's those kinds of illustrations where you can show a before and an after that speak more than any number of words. And most people didn't know that. So they didn't know an architect can draw this for you. And then you can say to your builder, that's what I want. That's what these books are really there to help. And so I've done over the years, a series of uh, what I call not so big show houses <laughs> that just illustrate this using that ceiling height as a big player, oftentimes using eight foot ceilings, just because we're so afraid of eight foot ceilings at this point that we think, you know, well, we definitely don't want that. But if you bring a ceiling down a little bit from eight feet, as long as you're not a super tall person, you're going to feel this variety of space. Penny, this is what I was telling you. This is the part for you. <laughs> so the ceiling, which doesn't cause any obstructions, defines spaces. Look at the window seat in this little picture. And you can see that in lowering that ceiling, it becomes an alcove. It's a cozy spot. It's super simple. It's not structural. And it's that kind of simplicity that allows people to implement these ideas. And of course, the master of this was Frank Lloyd Wright. And fortunately for us, we have many, many of his houses available and open to the public so that we can see them and people can go and kick the tires and feel it for themselves. I did find out that I accidentally made Frank Lloyd Wright two inches shorter than he actually was. So my apologies, Mr. Wright, <laughs> when I wrote about him. But you can see he uses ceiling height a lot. And, and it's the crafting of that space that allows for his houses to feel much larger than they actually are. So what happened with this, this first book and then the books that followed was that it attracted people who were interested in these characteristics of beauty and balance, harmony, seeing their home as a sanctuary, 
almost always interested in sustainability and a sense of well-being. They were not interested in knocking the socks off the neighbors. Doesn't mean that there's not a whole industry that's catering to a different part of the population, but there is a big chunk of the world that wants a different kind of house. And so that's who ended up learning from this uh, whole book series and innumerable architects that have been doing exactly this and starting very successful residential practices uh, since the 90s. But at the core, is this very, very simple idea. And that is that beauty matters. It's the, one of the most sustainable acts we can make. If you have a highly energy efficient house that's extremely ugly, I would argue that is not sustainable because the human beings have to want to look after it. That's why so many of the bungalows that we all know and love are still in incredibly good shape over a hundred years later. That's what, why beauty matters. And so energy efficiency in my book, not only includes the, the way the walls are built, the indoor air quality, all of the things that we now know how to do, but also beauty. So this is really where we begin to understand that we are an integral part of this planet. And as we start to engage our own worlds and look, look at what am I learning from the people I'm working with? Who am I interfacing with that really don't understand what I'm talking about? And how are they not understanding? I began to see, excuse me. <coughs> Bear with me one second, screw cap. Also a different, very difficult when you have essential tremor to do that with a glass. <laughs> um, so I started to see that we all are getting messages all the time about what is needed, both in our careers and in our own lives. And a big piece of where I believe we need to address climate change is our own internal climate. Now, this sounds like a, a silly leap, but I believe it's a very, very important part of the whole puzzle because everything is integral. And so as we start to look at our own lives and how they're getting out of control and how we can engage in things more consciously, we also then have the possibility of affecting that outer world in an equally uh, conscious way. So the very simplest of, of uh, notions is that we need a life remodeling. And in fact, this, the not, not so big life uses the metaphor of a remodeling to just look at the different places in your life where things are either very separate or where there are things that are obstacles to starting to really do what you oftentimes know you want to do, but just believe oh, I can't do that. And you've got lots of good reasons, but the reasons are often because of just either cultural or obligatory ideas that need to be questioned. So we are connected these days, but <laughs> what are we missing with all our devices? If you can see the, uh, what I euphemistically and probably politically incorrectly call a little old lady standing in this crowd without a cell phone, she's the only one that is experiencing what's happening. Everybody else is experiencing it through their phones. And although, I mean, I did this on the beach today, you know, it's like, wow, there's a seagull. But there's, there's something that separates us from the complete experiencing. And so I just try to bring people to the awareness of what is in the way what is the separation between you and what's going on in your life? And many of us, I, I would venture to say for most people in this room, probably most of us feel overwhelmed a lot of the time because there's just too much. All of our wonderful time-saving devices have also allowed us to tune into not just our own thoughts, but everybody else's as well. That's cacophony. <laughs> And so learning how to manage that becomes a huge part of being successful in this climate change that we're talking about internally. Einstein is famous for saying this quote, 
we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used to create them. <laughs> Speaking of cell phones, <laughs> it's all right, no problem. So what are we missing here? We try very hard to get everybody to understand what it is that we're talking about, but we have to start looking outside of our normal frame of reference. Things are not quite as they appear to be. And this is my, this next one is my favorite slide. The, the model of metal pieces is an absolute mess. But if you look at it from just the right angle, there is extraordinary order and beauty. And I believe that we're living in a world where when we look at things differently, to go back to the Einstein quote, looking from a higher perspective, we start to see in a totally different way. And that's where I really want to start to appeal to you in this audience as you gather every two years and in your associations with each other over the course of the in-between times. Look for the order and for what you're seeing that others can't and start to communicate about that because that's what can be world changing. So the biggest teaching I have uh, within the not so big life is really that if you look with the eyes of a student, absolutely everything can teach you. When we're in reaction and we're saying that shouldn't have happened or we're frustrated or we're angry, we miss the food that's in the moment. And so the book is really about how to learn to just be here and watch what is actually happening and how do I engage this in a way that's constructive and going that I'm going to learn from. It's all about you, actually. And as you do that, strangely enough, far from it being a selfish act, it becomes something where you are the point of calm in the middle of the storm. Because life, you know, like my experience this morning on the beach, it's the experiencing of the experience. It's not about the stories we have around what we're doing. And so as we start to engage the experiencing, there will be moments like that moment when I was writing the introduction to the not so big house and realized, oh, not so big house. Yes, that's better than small house. That those inspirations come to you, but most of us walk past them because we don't have time to pay attention. So here's some of what we miss when we don't pay attention. It's the moments of order. They're stunning. They are all around us. And we don't even notice because we're too busy. So pay attention to what your moments like that are because we all have them. We have these moments of epiphany. It's yours to do something with, to pay attention to, to move from that place. And rather than focusing on what we don't want, which Lord knows we see plenty of these days, Focus on what you do want, because our thoughts are the architects of our world. One of the strange things about thought is it doesn't hear, I don't want. It hears whatever the subject of the sentence is. So as you really, we are literally casting our ideas out into the world. Focus on what you want to bring into the world. And it, that's world changing, because you are casting that wish into the world. Sounds crazy, but it really works that way. The other one, which I love, this is from a, a former teacher of mine. He said, the trick is to recognize that the shit that falls on you is fertilizer. <laughs> so when bad stuff happens, this is a reframe, but it's a very real part of life. It's not there to drive you crazy. It's there to help you learn if you learn to look with the eyes of a student. And so as a, as a tool in your activities, in your everyday lives, in your careers, that little piece of information can be an enormous game changer. So I want to ask each of you who's here tonight, what is it that inspires you? And what is it that you notice 
needs to be spoken or needs to be addressed that you're seeing because you have that perspective that nobody else does. That's your view into what's needed. And you have the capacity. In fact, your whole life has been preparing you to act on that. But you have to be willing. So by placing your focus on that, that's world changing. So we have just one life. And I love this quote. I don't know who said it, but why aren't we running like we're on fire towards our wildest dreams? Because it does change things. When I started my whole book series, I couldn't possibly have imagined what happened. No way. I thought I was writing the not so big house for my colleagues in my firm and maybe a few other architects. But it was an idea that was needed and then doors open right, left, and center. I wasn't a famous person before I wrote that book, not at all. All of us have the capacity when we move with what our heart longs to do. And something many of us these days notice, the words heart and earth are made of the same letters. Essentially, they are the same and we are part of that planet. So when the planet wants something, the way it expresses it is through you through your longing to act. And our notion that, well, I can't do that is what we need to confront, not the idea that we can't do it is true. It's not. So that moving with what your heart longs to do is truly the bridge to a sustainable future. I just wanted to write. I didn't even know what I wanted to write, but in that act, I, not, not Sarah, but, the books that I've written have changed innumerable lives. That was the most sustainable thing I could possibly have done. So this is what Gandhi was really talking about. There's a story that some of you probably know that Gandhi used to hold these huge audiences and a woman came up to Gandhi with her overweight son. And she said to Gandhi, would you please tell my son to stop eating all this candy because I can't seem to stop them. And Gandhi looked at the little boy, looked at the mother and said, ma'am, I want you to come home, come back in a couple of weeks. So she looked at him and said, okay, went away. Two weeks later, came back, little boy in tow. And she said, uh, sir, now will you tell my son to stop eating all these candies? And Gandhi looked the little boy in the eye and he said, son, I want you to stop eating sweets and candy. They're not good for you. At which point the woman said, sir, why couldn't you have said that to him two weeks ago? And he said, ma'am, two weeks ago, I did not know if I myself could stop eating sweets and candy. We must be the change we wish to see in the world. What he means is, we have absolutely zero capacity of changing the world until we ourselves are living what we are espousing because this is our dream world. We are literally dreaming this. And as we engage, we start to change it. And it changes very quickly when we're willing to have the courage of our convictions and really live what we're saying. And that means on the inside as well as the outside. So as you change, the world has to change with you. That's actually the nature of what's happening here. There's a lot more that I could say, as you can probably tell. <laughs> and uh, if you want to see one thing, um, I did a TEDx talk for San, uh, for San Diego a few years ago, which will give you the, the I think it's a 16 minute version. <laughs> of what I'm talking about, but it will help you to understand a little bit more and perhaps inspire you even further to, uh, to take a look at your own life and what you're being asked to do in the world. And I posted this on my Facebook page ahead of time so that you can find it easily. So it's the first, first thing up there right now. So just in closing, I believe it's time for a not so big solution and you're the answer. Thank you so much.